Hey friends, Dean here. Before we get you on to your episode, I want to take a moment to invite you to our next virtual online trivia night. Wednesday, May 13th at 8 p.m. Join us either on our Facebook group or on our YouTube page for three rounds of fun trivia, music questions, movie questions, general knowledge questions. It'll be a fun time and a chance to win some prizes and have just a good relaxing night uh, of some trivia at, at home. You don't even have to go out for it. So don't forget, Wednesday, March 13th at 8 p.m. Join us on our Facebook group or YouTube for three rounds of fun virtual online trivia. We'll see you there. In this episode, we're talking about an artist whose debut album was one of the best selling of all time. That artist is Jewel, and the album is Pieces of You. Stay with us. Get ready for the 3324 Podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Coover share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome to the 3324 Podcast. If you're new, welcome to the show. And uh, we've got a lot of back catalog available for you uh, for our existing uh, and returning listeners. Welcome back. We, we've missed you. It's been a week. It's yep. been a week or so, a whole right, Eric? week. That's right. It's been yeah. a whole seven days, and <laughs> we've been waiting. Oh, it felt so long. Yeah. I haven't left this chair. <laughs> I just sit here and wait until we do the next, po- just waiting for like the time when we're going to record. Uh, yeah. You're like, you're like John Gill from that Star Trek episode. That's right. Just, they a prop, figure, they, he's, he's, he's just, just a figurehead figure now. They just prop him up in the, in the chair, and he's just staring straight ahead. There. That's, that's all I am. I, I'm just a figurehead now, a, sh- a shell of what he once was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. (laughs) So we've, we've got a special guest and she hasn't said anything yet. So we need to introduce her. So we've got, uh, Kelly Cooper. And if the last name sounds familiar, well, it's, you're correct. Uh, it is Eric's wife, but Kelly is going to be helping us out with this, with this episode where we talk about Jewel and, and her album pieces of you. Hello, Kelly. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. Thank you guys for having me. Oh, thanks for, uh, for suggesting this, uh, this album for us to, to talk about. And we certainly want to hear your take and point of view on it. And, and it was a very interesting time when this album came out. So we're going to dive into some of that uh, stuff that was happening on, at, on the periphery as well. So um, let's get going with it. So let's uh, let's unload the stats. Let's unpack that luggage and then we'll we'll get into it. So this album, Pieces of You by Joel, it was her debut album mm-hmm. released in February of 1995. Did not chart initially. So that's one of the, a lot of strange things going, are going on with this album. And we're going to, yeah. so not only yep. about its impact, but just actually the making of it or the recording or the circumstances. Very interesting. Right. Uh, produced by Ben Keith. There were four singles released. Now here's the first interesting piece. We had just said that it was, re- the album was released in February of 1995. The first single did not come out until June of 1996. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So this was really a, uh, had a had a delayed fuse on it, so that was the, the four singles were who will, who will save your soul, hit number four, you were meant for me. I sing that to Eric all the time. That was number two. <laughs> yeah, he does. And actually, then he yeah. says, and then the, the third single was Foolish Games, which is what he says to me. That's absolutely correct. That, all, you, that right? also hit. That also hit number two, <laughs> and then Morning Song, uh, and and Morning Song was released in 1998. So not only did yeah. this album come out in 95, the first single wasn't released till 96. It had charting singles a full two years after that. Mm-hmm. The album itself hit number four on the charts and that stayed on the charts for two years. Yeah. <laughs> so this this is a, a multi-year uh, odyssey or opus of or journey of this album, how it was released, didn't do anything, didn't never charted. A couple of things happened. Uh, it went twelve times platinum as mm-hmm. well. So, like I said in the in the open, one of the the biggest selling debut albums of all time. Uh, crazy, crazy. So, so it's a it's a slow burn. It, it kind of yeah. A, a sl- yeah yeah a slow burn. But it, yeah. oddly enough, that the strange thing about it is you know Jewel was is from Alaska but she was at this point when we catch up to her in her career was in San Diego mm-hmm. working as a barista homeless uh playing in coffee houses as well got the attention of some labels and there was a bidding war 
over 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 her her contract and her albums. So that's kind of kind of a, a, a weird thing is that record labels are bidding over her, but then her album comes out and it doesn't really do anything initially. Like it doesn't yeah. chart, nothing happens with it. Usually when there's a bidding war, there's some type of big promotion or or big push, or this is gonna be a big artist. Um, the curious thing is Bob Dylan ends up hearing about her and then says, Hey, uh, why don't you come on tour with me? And yeah. you know what? That's like, that's like getting the stamp, you know, the grade a stamp of that's seal of quite, approval. That's quite the feather in the cap yeah. there. Yeah. 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 So yeah, when, if Dylan yeah. takes notice and, you know, and, and that, and Jewel was right in that wheelhouse, I'm not comparing her to Dylan, but right in that, that's the singer songwriter, the guitar, the, the, the kind of vulnerable lyrics, um, mm-hmm. all that stuff was, is right in, in Dylan's wheelhouse. So it, it might be curious to think about it initially, but then when you really listen to this album, it's not so far of a stretch for Dylan. Right. Yeah. She, she's very much, uh, I always felt she was a, a younger version of like Joni Mitchell. I mean, she just, you know, just the type of quality of the songwriting, you know, was it's more like poetry, much like Joni's writing in the, you know, in the early days, not, you know, Carol King, you know, had like, you know, straight up love songs and that kind of thing. But, but Joni's lyrics were always more, more lyrical, more poetic. And I think Jewel kind of follows that, that mold. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, I kind of went backwards into it where I got into Jewel and it was funny because I graduated in 1995. And when I was looking, I was like, what exact year and stuff I was looking up to prepare. And I was like, I know that I wasn't listening to her in high school. So I knew that, you know, her singles didn't come out until a couple of years late, like to where I was really, you know, listening. And then of course getting the album, but I really, I always liked singer songwriters, but I didn't get into it until I really devoured this album. And then I went backwards and I was like, okay, let me listen to these originals, you know, and see, you know, what kind of stories they told and how, and lyrics have always been like what I am attracted to in music the music accompaniment always helps it out but if you don't have the words to it i'm not i usually don't get into it so yeah i I think i think there's a couple of different camps and i tend to fall somewhat into the other one right some people are are, it's all about the like the lyrics i need to connect to it i want to hear the story for for other people it's it's more the 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 music part of it or the production or what it what went into it you know Mm -hmm. and and i tend to fall towards that side where I'm more interested in the whole overall sound. And, and I guess because of some of the artists I listen to, the lyrics aren't that like yeah. deep and heavy. It's <laughs> yeah. it's more in service of the song, right? So when you get someone like Jewel uh, or Dylan or Joni Mitchell, right? There, there's that, that they're coming from a certain standpoint. They're not coming at it from, I want to lay as much production onto this, onto these songs as I can. And let me put how many instruments it is. And that was the thing about this album with Jewel is, some of it was recorded live. So That's right. there, there was, yep. it was recorded in the coffee house. You want to talk about saving money <laughs> for yeah. the label. It's yeah. kind of like, you know, some, some, some artists get like a big contract and they just blow out the budget, go, you know, right. spending yep. every dollar and doing every trick. And, and, and this album is quite the opposite where it's, it's very sparse. Um, very few songs in, in my couple of listens, are, are you know it's just usually some some sparse guitar accompaniment but that's the way she was writing those songs mm-hmm. and that's the way she felt comfortable performing them as well right Which yeah is- and something that i had uh pointed out to eric was like um when you go to her live shows she never does who will save your soul the same way it's always completely different so yep. if you notice that's the one that's recorded in the studio it's not live because i'm sure that would have driven them crazy to try and pick which version, you know what I mean? But they kind of like that nailed was, down one. Yeah. And, but when you go to the shows, it's never the same, which is yeah, great. Which I, I like, which I, I always, I always love when an artist does that, you know, for me, it was always like the, the, the ultimate proving ground is this is the stage where they could branch out and change up the lyrics, change the melody, change, you know, the, the arrangement of the song somehow uh, you're kind of flexing your muscles there, but, but yeah, who will save your soul was like the hook that kind of got me into the into the record. And I'm thinking, well, this is like not unlike like Tuesday Night Music Club by Cheryl Crow. It's yep. like that kind of production, that kind of sort of quirky. Kind of, well, and a also, lot more you know, sparse though, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, j- just a little piece of trivia: this was recorded at Neil Young's 
studio. Oh, wow. Um, with some that. of his backing band at the time. So whatever, mm. whatever, it wasn't crazy horse, but whatever, whatever backing band Neil Young had at the yeah. time, <laughs> whatever hanging they were out, called, hanging out with the Buffaloes, <laughs> uh, it, you know, yeah. the, they, they, for whatever sparse instrumentation there was, and there's a couple of songs, uh, that's, so you're talking about like, okay, Bob Dylan sees her and says, open for me, uh, gets to record at Neil Young's studio and gets to use some of his backing musicians. So, uh, that, that's kind of a lot of pressure. I would also think from from yeah. someone who's literally homeless, living in a car, playing coffee houses, to then all of a sudden be part of a bidding war mm -hmm. for her for her talents, and then these big artists kind of taking no notice of her or, and or taking her under their wing. Yeah. Um, and and like Eric had said, you know, I want to point out a couple of things before we get into the album is that there was a lot of other things going on in the run up, and I want to ask Kelly about about some of it too specifically, but. But actually, Eric had written, Eric stole a little of my thunder uh, because I, I wrote down that I wrote down Tuesday Night Music Club by Sheryl Crow, which came yeah. out um, in 1993. So that that kind of signaled a, a, a kind of a resurgence of of female solo artists, mm -hmm. um, the kind of kind of the singer songwriter thing. Sheryl Crow skews a, a lot more towards rock, but it was kind of signaling something different. You know, and, and then the next shot across the bow really was the same year that Pieces of You came out. That came out in February. In June, um, a little album called Jagged Little Pill came out. Yes. Yeah. By Alanis Morissette. Now, is that something that you had, you had connected with also, Kelly? Yes. That was something that we listened to a lot also around the same time. But that was more commercial to me and more something that I felt like everyone, I don't know, I, I guess this is the whole thing that why I love Jewel is because I felt like I internalized that album a lot more and Jagged Little Pill was so, I mean, it came out with a big bang, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like a lot of people were into it right away and mm -hmm. all that. I mean, I, I very much enjoyed it, don't get me wrong, but it was just a different feeling. It was more, to me, more commercial and more like, um, it didn't hit me deep like Jewel did. So why, why do you, why do you think that? Because if you, I mean, it's, it's two artists that are really kind of laying their soul bare, right? Cause uh, the Alana, Jagged Little Pill is very personal as well. Very personal. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Jewel is, is kind of, these are kind of like yin, yin and yang where, yeah, you, where you like, you're correct. Jagged Little Pill was, was, I mean, <laughs> Pieces of You was a monster as well. It is certainly no slouch, but Jagged Little Pill just kind of erupted, and really brought everything to the forefront. And again, you make a good point. Pieces of you had come out, but it's, it was still wasn't doing anything. Jagged little pill comes out a, a little while later, explodes. And then jewel kind of comes around in 96 and starts kind of hitting the charts. Yeah. So is, is, had you heard jagged little pill first or was jewel the first exposure? No, I had heard jagged little pill first. Okay. Um, yeah, I had definitely heard that album. And then, I don't really know. It was just kind of one of those things like, well, we had an alternative rock station in Tampa that that was our go-to station. They were playing, you know, Nirvana and all the, you know, the, all the things they weren't sure, you know, it didn't fit into rock. It didn't fit into, you know, like, okay, well, I'll go on to. Was it like the, the musical, was it like the musical dumping ground? Yeah. yeah it was, <laughs> we, I mean, we don't you know, see, got, so just play it. Yeah, yeah. You got, you got great stuff, but um, <laughs> yeah, it was different. So that's where you really get introduced to stuff and then kind of like pick, pick which one, you know, you felt. And like I said, uh, with who will save your soul actually was, you know, the first single that I was like, Oh wow. Who is this? Like her voice is so unique and all that kind of stuff. But it's just like most singles, like that's, that ends up not being your favorite on mm -hmm. the album yeah. because yeah. it's like, yeah. you know, you hear it a lot and then you're like, oh, well, there's this like little hidden gem in here that, that you have to get into. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll get into that too. I want to hit a couple of more points on our, on our path to pieces of you. And, and another important part was um, 1997, uh, Sarah McLaughlin, mm -hmm. her album mm -hmm. Surfacing comes out. Okay. So we're, you're starting to see this groundswell much like we saw in in 91 with the groundswells of grunge where there was this rumbling you started to see all these female artists really kind of coming to the forefront with personal stories not you know not afraid to kind of put themselves out there and and really deal with subjects that hadn't been dealt with in in, in that way also and in 97 we would get Lilith Fair 
right? Yep. Which is which is kind of the epitome of this. I mean, let me roll off the the first Lilith Fair was ninety seven, um, and just let me roll off some of these artists, and they might sound familiar, right? Sarah McLaughlin, Cheryl Crow, mm-hmm. Tracy Chapman, Jewel, and these are these are main stage artists. Paula Cole, Suzanne Vega, Mary yeah. Chapin yeah. Carpenter, Fiona yeah. Apple. <laughs> Fiona Apple, yeah. Wow. Joan Osborne, The Cardigans, Emmy Lou Harris, Lisa Loeb, Indigo Girls, Sean Colvin, Meredith Brooks. She had that song Bitch at the time, which was pretty mm-hmm. big. Uh, Tracy Bonham, India Ari, and Natalie Merchant. I mean, that's like uh, that's like the Avengers. <laughs> yeah, it's right yeah, of, of, of artists at, at that time. I mean, that that was the main stage. Mm-hmm. The the side stage, like the not even the, the second stage, but the side stage was Dido, Pat Benatar. I mean, just like, are you kidding? All, all the all the artists that were involved in this is just absolutely crazy. Dar Williams, Leah Andrioni, um, Juliana Hatfield, Susanna Hoffs. This was all the first Lilith yeah. Fair. That's crazy. So you have this 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 upsurge of of very talented women with a lot to say, and you, like you said, Jewel had a, had a throughout all this had a very distinctive voice, mm-hmm. which I think is is kind of what separated her also because it's very easy to kind of go up there with a guitar but her her she had a certain kind of style and delivery and, and the different things she did with her voice as well yep yeah that i mean that song was uh, she would joke later you know you've seen you know, we've seen it a couple of times in like later shows um i think she commented it was the, the her most recent show that we saw was was her own personal story it's like she had just come out with her autobiography and she was basically with songs telling her her whole life story. And she would joke that, you know, who will save your soul is like she, oh, I sounded like Kermit the Frog. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that comes up a lot. You know, people like, you know, who will save? You know, I like think this, so. You know, but, you know, no. no, we didn't at the time. She definitely but, has that. She, you know, yeah, she definitely has that kind of, uh, I, I don't know what you call it, but it's kind of almost a house. She makes up like a, a hollow sound with her voice. Yodeling. Yeah, yeah. She, she does. Yeah, she, she, she's a very good yodeler. You know, if you've ever seen her live, she she does it. She does, and she she's amazing. You know, when she does yeah. that kind of stuff, so o- she, she used to do that with her dad a lot. I guess the know, only so. yodels I'm associated with are the ones covered in chocolate. <laughs> oh, of course, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but yeah, that that who's who of, put that out there. <laughs> that who's who of Lilith Fair though. That's amazing. That's an amazing. Uh, yeah, so so I mean, that just, is that is, that's your CD book. That's your that's your uh, you know that's the, all those artists were in that. Yeah, in that, I mean you just know, just. <laughs> just think and and that you know that there was an idea of let's you know let's do a uh, a festival of of just you know female and and women artists or yeah. or women that lead groups that are the leaders of groups you know just for just to and and wow that was just a i didn't even realize it when i first read that i'm like wow that is just a powerhouse i mean mm-hmm. you know top to bottom natalie merchant was like at the bottom of the list and it's like what absolutely crazy so there was definitely a lot of of a vibrant scene going on with, with the, 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 the female singer songwriter, almost eclipsing. I mean, it, it kind of was like almost the answer to grunge yeah. and, and the answer to like that alt pop that was kind of coming out at that time where it's like, well, you know, not everybody wants to listen to that and, and maybe not spice girls either. So what else is there? And and there was this resurgence of, sure. of this type yeah. of like, like Eric had said, you know, Carol King style, Laura Nero, Mm-hmm. Uh, Joni Mitchell and and Jewel is very much in that kind of vulnerable storytelling mode. Yeah, very diary sounding lyric. Like this sounds just like stuff that was kind of written almost as stream of consciousness for so, uh, in some way, and then and then kind of formed into a song. Especially, you know, especially something like "You Were Meant for Me." Yeah, you know, which is probably my favorite song. I think, and and it's no it's no surprise that that's the most produced song as well yeah, yeah, yeah. But, the, but she but that one but no here's the thing though the the album version is not the same version yeah, as she had the to single it. she yeah. had to re-record it and that has a lot more polish to it than i actually prefer the album version because it's more vulnerable and it's more and her vocal on that song is more uh emotive and vulnerable and and just yeah it's it's it you know it, it's it actually surprised me because i was looking to hear that when i finally bought the album i was like oh you know because you hear the song at that point, it had just come out all over the radio, and I was, you know, waiting to hear like this isn't the same version. It just, it, it just surprised me. It just yeah. how, how odd the album was that way. It was like very sparse. You know, you know, we 
you know, yeah, talk- very, not a not a lot of production to it, but but I kind of it, it was almost kind of like a, for me a breath of fresh air when it I did hear it. something. Yeah, absolutely, that, that suits was it. a little yeah. more produced though. Kind of, it kind of helped break that up a little bit. You know, yeah. um, for me, uh, and I think you know her. I, I kind of liked her her in that setting because she wasn't totally reliant on her voice. She was able to you know have some production behind her mm-hmm. and kind of work work her voice in a little different way. So so Kelly, so we're catching up with you of. In 95, kind of checking out Alanis Morissette, and then after that, Jewel arrives on the scene. And and what made you kind of pick that up? Was that was that from hearing it on the radio or? Yeah, um, just from, I want to say, I probably had a couple of friends that were already into it because I know my two best friends were, you know, big into any artist on Lil' Affair. And we were always trading, you know, oh, do you, you know, do you have your, these guys, you know, what have you. So I think that I probably, but I, the one thing that I remember is that once I did, you know, and of course then it was a cassette tape. Once I got it, it was like Cass- a cassette concert. tape. What is that? <laughs> well, it was after <laughs> <laughs> Um, Actually, of course, the CD was yeah. when I, I got that and I was like, it was a constant companion. Like I, there was constantly, it was playing because for some reason, and I had moved out on my own, moved in with my friend. So I have four siblings, parents. I had never been alone before. So I was like, you know, the days where she was working and stuff like that, Jewel was my constant companion. She was just always there, you know, keeping me occupied or, you know, in my ear because silence is not a friend of mine. Like I, I enjoy being alone, but I always like things going on. Like, yeah. Sad. Yeah. And, and that's an, it's an interesting parallel too, because Jewel was by herself, uh, was yeah. living alone and, and kind of translating some of these feelings into her songs. Also, you do get kind of that feeling in some of the songs. Sure. Some of them are sound very ordinary, just like things going on during the day. Mm-hmm. But you kind of get that, that, that feeling of just like a simple, kind of a simple life, you know, it, it's kind of, uh, again, mostly, mostly you were meant for me. I think kind of really epitomizes that with with her lyrics of just kind of putting on the TV, hopping to bed, and just kind of like like very simple stuff. And and it didn't have to be it didn't have to be something deep happening to have a deep meaning. In in, in order to connect to that, mm-hmm. just those some of those simple things. And you know what? She wrote every song on this album. I mean, she co-wrote two, but. This was just a, a labor of love and, and stuff that she had been working up, you know, in the coffee house, yeah. you know, and, and experiencing life. And she did a little bit of traveling and then ended up in San Diego and was kind of was just kind of right there. And then work in the coffee house. And here comes the rec- here comes the record fam- company. It felt familiar. It felt like I knew her, like I could connect, you know, and like even re-listening because you know i'll i'll still listen to songs here and there but i re-listen to the entire album and of course i find myself like bawling at painters and i'm like it still (laughs) hits you you know like it still goes i still go back to like the first time i heard it and how it was just a very important like in my formative first getting out of my own years like this was a very important album you know it was something that you know like I said, I always had going on and could almost understand how she was feeling when she was writing these. And then sure. when I started learning more about her story and how she was, you know, living in her car and stuff like that. And, you know, at that time, going to the coffee house was a very popular thing to do, to just going in and thinking, oh, you know, she was in a place just like this. And yeah. And, and I think, you know, uh, it's not that her music is juvenile whatsoever, it's, but it's coming from a certain point of view and a certain age. Yeah. And I think if you're at that point, it's, it's one of those perfect meldings. Um, Cause I know some other people that, that this affected in the same way and they were of that age. So it really spoke to mm-hmm. what they were going through or feelings or, or how, you know, how, how to, how to deal with your feelings or, you know, any of those things that, that kind of come when you're maturing. Cause she was what, 19, 20, yeah. Um, when, when this came out or when she was recording it. So she was really young, you know, and that's a lot to go through, you know, the circumstances of her life. And then again, like I said, getting thrown in, thrust into the spotlight, but yeah. out comes this, this really personal, like kind of, I don't want to say little album, but I mean, little in its sparseness, 
Mm-hmm. Right. And, and it almost sounds like uh, kind of like it was thrown together. Right. It was just very, yeah, very kind of spare. Sweet. Just mostly everything is just a good her with her guitar and, and laying out those lyrics. And perhaps maybe that's why it took a little bit longer for it for it to latch on. Maybe people weren't really used to that. Like Jagged Little Pill is, is a stark contrast to musically to you yeah. know, this album. And, you know, it's very, it's darker and it's more yeah, abrasive hard, hard, and it's harder, harder rougher edged. edge. And she's talking about, you know, getting darker dumped by people and, you know, that kind of thing, like you know, bad relationships and that kind of, and really going to town on, on some of that stuff. But Jewel, and here comes Jewel with this, you know, a lot of this sort of very soft, but yeah, much no more le- gentle and vulnerable, but no, but no less poignant, you know? So, yeah. yeah. That, and that's the thing yeah. is, is they, they kind of, like I said, they kind of occupied opposite sides of the same coin is, mm-hmm. is Alanis Marset kind of represented the, the darker yeah, kind the of kind aspects of, of relationships and, and yeah. what she had been through. And Jewel, even though she had been through a lot was her lyrics are, are for the most part, a lot more hopeful and just kind of like, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to live my life. And it's just the simple things that, yeah. that are important and being in love and that kind of stuff, you know, not, not every song is like that, but, I always, but for the most part, if you, if, you know, to, co- to contrast the two, if you're into, yeah. if you're into both of them, I think that's where it lies is they're both getting the same point across just in different ways. I always felt that there was a, uh, a definite confidence in her, in, in her songwriting, how she presented the songs, you know, she could turn that on, like she could sound vulnerable, but you know, but it's, it's confident. It's like, it's like, it's not like she's putting on an act, but it's, it's, it's real. She, she, she can do that, flex those vocal muscles that way where she can go soft. She can get loud, you know, when she wants to and really get that emotion out there. And I always thought, and I always thought she was kind of cheeky at the same time too. She had a kind of a sarcasm, but not cynical. You know, mm-hmm. she was never cynical. She was all but, but sarcastic. She would look at life in a very sort of, uh, uh, you know, a certain point of view, like, you know, just in, in, a, in, a, in a different pair of eyes that that was interesting and refreshing to, you know, when other people are just Ooh, life, life sucks or, you know, this or whatever. She <laughs> she would present it like, you know, it, it's, it's kind of tongue in cheek in a way like, she, you know, she would comment. Like it was like a commentary on life, you know, yeah. in, in, from a, that point of view. So I always enjoyed that about her, you know, so I, I, so, so oh. Kelly, you mentioned painters. What, what about that? What about that song? I can't really talk about it without crying. <laughs> but That's, it's, let, it's, let me tell you something. Hang on, hang on before you go any further. Uh, Eric pretty much goes every episode talking about a song that brought tears to his eyes. Yeah. So, I, and I'm gonna, I'm working on a playlist called Eric Cried <laughs> because he always has one. So don't worry about that because we've but already yet, got that. Uh, we got the market but yet, corner. But I've yet yeah. to cry on, no. you know, on the air. So yeah, I'm no, not sure. I, I, I won't. But so that's that's gonna be Dean's. <laughs> he's gonna be determined to make me cry. <laughs> you know. So anyway. It's the idea of these two people who have this connection through art and even though, you know, and and you don't get details like they were this old and this happened, but you kind of get this feeling like the imagery of how she paints the watercolor flowers and the this and that, you can just see this couple and how, you know, their relationship evolved. Mm-hmm. And I just always found that very, like a true representation of people who care about each other without it being hokey or like, you know, yeah. puppy yeah. dog love. It's a, it's a much deeper experience of love the way. I yeah. Cause it's come. Yeah. Cause like you, you had said, it's kind of, uh, you know, they, they had lived there, they had gone through their whole life at that point, you know, the, mm-hmm. the lyrics kind of 80 years old, an old lady now sitting on the front porch. So yeah, it's not like, Oh, I'm, I'm just getting out of high school and I'm in love and you know, ha-ha. Yeah, you know, those, it's are, kind those of, are the best kinds of love songs. It's kind of deal. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of dealing with yeah. it on, on a, on a, 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 a kind of a deeper meaning, a deeper level of love that, you know, they've, they've kind of yeah. spent, spent their life together. And she's kind of, you know, kind of imagining that as well. Like what, what would that be like? Right. Mm-hmm. And I think the fact that, because I, am creative in a uh, artistic way and I enjoy listening to music. So the idea of those two things being married together in a song was really like, wow, you know, it was just very touching and impressive to me that someone could invoke such imagery yeah, with, with the lyrics. So that was, that was why that particular one always stuck out. And it, I haven't really heard a lot of other songs that were, 
Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and and she is really adept at that. Is 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 you know kind of painting pictures with words, and that's real important if you're gonna just be there with a guitar and really sparse arrangements. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to kind of be able to deliver that, right? That's is, right. Is, yeah, you're gonna need to get your audience's attention, and you're not gonna be able to do it with kind of a gimmicky song that you're just kind of strumming away on. Because, you know, it really needs to have that that punch and. Uh, on this album, like song after song is the same thing. It's it's lyrical painting uh, pictures with with words, definitely. Yeah. Um, what what other songs did you connect with? Well, <laughs> I have to tell you a funny story because like years after I was into this album, I went on a road trip with my parents, and I, I had our son <laughs> at the time, so yeah. that's how long you know. So it, I can't remember what year it was, but he was young. It was probably like two thousand seven, eight, something like that, and. I went on this road trip with my family and I was like so excited because I put Jewel in and um, I can't remember what song was it? Pieces, Pieces of You. Of you. <laughs> Pieces of You. Pieces of You, yeah, yeah the title that's, track. Yeah. Yes. That's, an un- that's an uncomfortable song. And it is, a, it is a bit <laughs> uncomfortable. A and my dad goes, what's this shit? <laughs> I turned it over and I'm like, oh man, I really Enough. I could just see de- enough to pulling the yep. tape now, throwing it out the window. <laughs> No, but don't get just get after the <laughs> past this song and it'll be fine. Yeah. You know? like, it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right though. Yeah, and, 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 and she was very uncomfortable, but that's the point is like Yeah, that, now that, it's all back around. Like that song really threw me after, you know, Who Will Save Your Soul opens the album and then you get to that. And I'm yeah, like, and then you get a song as, as bracing as I'm pieces like, of you and, and as I'm direct. Like, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's a very yeah. direct song. So and maybe mm. uncomfortable for, for, for people to hear, but but that's it's right. it's got some truisms to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, she's not saying anything that's kind of out of out out of line per per se, because right. it's you know, it's literally, you know, she's questioning are these things pieces of you? Is that why you have a problem with them? Yeah. Is because you have a problem looking inward mm-hmm. uh, and, and you recognize these things potentially. That's great. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. As so far as like um, the, another thing is like foolish game. If you listen mm-hmm. to that, you really get her sense of um, where she comes out of that really high voice. And it's a much deeper, like soulful mm-hmm. kind of, which know? I love. I love when yeah. she does that. Yeah. My favorite track is near you always. I think that is, if, if any song is is a song that Kelly and I connect with, I think it's that one. It's it's the one that kind of I think of as uh, when we were starting out as a couple. I mean, this album was kind of played a lot, and um, so yeah, that that we I kind of connect with that one. And there was her writing partner, interestingly enough, a guy by the name I got to do a little shout out here to a guy named Steve Pulse who co-wrote "You Were Meant for Me." Mm-hmm. He was, you know, doing, you know, playing a lot of shows with her on the circuit and, you know, that kind of thing. When there was I an think album, they dated it too briefly. Yeah, yeah there was did. an album that came out in, in 98 when her second record came out, Spirit. And that was One Left Shoe, which I got because I knew uh, I had heard of Steve Pulch. You know me, I'm always looking at the artists who appear on albums and that kind of thing. That's how we that's how Dean and I got to know a lot of people because we pay attention <laughs> You know, we read those liner notes and we read, you know, who's playing or, what. That or kind of thing. you could, you yeah. could call it, you could call it paying attention or you could call it having nothing else to do. <laughs> to do. <That's- laughs> so there, there's two ways to look at that, honestly. That's right. So I actually, I actually bought that one on, uh, on CD. And uh, so that was a nice, that was also a nice companion piece to this album. Don't you agree, Cal? One is just, uh, yeah. that's a very, it's yeah, a, it, it was it debut. Was. Yeah. You could see where she got some of her inspiration from but also like um because she they do a she does backup on one of his songs and it's mm-hmm. like, i think like three or four little yeah yeah there's three or four songs there's like a, helping out one song and she but she doesn't like sing a full-on duet no, on any no, of the songs no. she's just, just there her presence is there just to help him out and that mm-hmm. that was another that, that they have that history where they can because at this point he he had not you know he wasn't really uh, I don't think he ever really made it big she you know skyrocketed to fame he was this was like his first record you know so he she kind of like helped him out so she I'm not going to come on your album and sing with you and overwhelm you know so she sang some nice tasteful backing vocals to like three or four songs and yeah it's a really it's a great album it's a nice it's a nice acoustic and uh like i said it's it was just it was just a really nice companion piece to pieces of you at this point we were also listening to spirit which is far more polished and you know her second album was 
more together in the studio and that kind of, it's actually my personal favorite of hers, you know, my just, spirit you know, spirit. Yeah. It is. It's fantastic. You know, yeah. But, um, it's really fun. um, yeah, I think but, this yeah. one, though, I mean, this is kind of one of those things, right? You see that then the artist becomes like, yeah, you got to make an album proper. Yeah, like you can't. That's right. And, and this is her kind of just like vulnerable. And I'm, su I'm frankly, I'm surprised that she was able to kind of wield that kind of influence mm -hmm. uh, and say, yeah, you know what? I like the live version of this because who does that on a, on a debut album from, from someone who's really not yeah. known. And, and and the funny thing about it is when you listen to the, the live songs, the song ends and, and they probably told people like, we're going to be recording this because the song ends and then people start clapping. So they could have easily cut the clapping out. Yeah. Right? They could have easily edited that out, but they left it in. Well, it was part of the, she wanted to let people yeah. know like, this is, yeah, like, I, like that's this my is experience. Where, yeah, yeah. This is this my is wheelhouse. This is where yep. I'm comfortable. That's where I started. And, and you're going to yep. get that experience. And, and it also kind of also goes to show that she's like, not, not a gimmick. Mm -hmm. Like there's not yeah. someone else playing the guitar, that's like, you know, exactly like, like she's was... just singing and that, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking because, you know, there's a lot of people who there's that the SNL curse where people are great and then they go on SNL and you hear how they really are, you know, it's <laughs> like, because it's not, it's live. So you can't really, you know, yeah. Lindsay, um, Lindsay Buckingham, we're, we're, we're thinking yeah. of you. <laughs> <We're trouble. laughs> he was good. I remember oh, he was good. He was yeah, great. That's the thing. It's like, you know, there's not that many people who could take, a recording of them playing in a public, you know, coffee. Yeah, house, no, right? that's very, that's a lot of confidence. Yeah. And, yeah. and so much so that she said, I'm more, I'm, I'm less comfortable actually in the studio, uh, that she preferred the performing them live like that, as opposed to going into the studio and singing to a wall. Like mm -hmm. she thrives off that, off that interaction or, or performing to people, uh, and and capturing her ca capturing their attention with her music, so that's really I mean kudos to that. I just when I when I listen to it because I never listened to the album like all the way through in one shot, so I'm kind of like, oh wow, there's like yeah, you know, and you would think like oh maybe they put in applause as like a gimmick type thing, like oh let's put some applause at the end of this, but no, it was it was live. I was like wow, like really uh, got got to give her kudos for that. Honestly, got to give her kudos. So what about you, Dean? What what's some of uh, some standout tracks? For you. Well, okay, let's go with <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let, let's go with a standout, but not for the reason you would you would think. Okay. <laughs> so the song that I thought was very peculiar. No, actually, Little Sister was okay. I love Little Sister. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and it's the longest song on the album. So you want to guess? Um, Take a crack at it. Daddy. No. Is it Daddy? Nope. Adrian. No. Adrian. Okay. Just a very strange song and, and her. Yeah. Again, her, the imagery, <laughs> you know exactly what's happened. <laughs> yeah. But, but just also like, like she really dials up the, the youthful sound of it. And like, like she is like a, like a preteen or a teenager, you know, kind of has that really almost, you know what it almost reminded me of in some ways, Cindy Lauper, like the way she like ratcheted up her vocal. I could see to have that. that, like yeah. that, uh, not like oh, I want to. I'm going to lose it, use this term loosely, but like that Betty Boopish, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of yeah. quality that Cindy Lauper had. Um, when I heard that, I'm kind of like, you know, which what she was going for to sound younger and more childlike, yeah, um, to get that across. So for me, I was like, ooh, that that kind of didn't hit it for me. But yeah, like Morning Song was good. Um, I'm sensitive is kind of like the closest thing to like a poppy, like up tempo song, mm -hmm. which I kind of like again, like you what. what she doesn't give it to you very often. So when you get it, it's kind of like you're, it's kind of like, Oh, okay. This is really something different, you know, which I kind of dug. And yeah. that's like, I like, I like the quirky stuff. So that's like, like a really quirky, strange yeah. song, especially kind of in, in this mix of things. But, but you, for me, you were meant for me. That's got like the, the, you know, the, the produced version. Um, the, her vocals on that are just, she's like, she's kind of tearing your heart, really tearing your heart out. Honestly, mm -hmm. It's kind of really just so soulful and so emotional um, that that for me, that this is all about, it, it's all about you were meant for me, for me, for me. You were meant for me, for me. <laughs> and I, I just got to go with um, Angel Standing By is probably like vocal wise. I think it's absolutely stunning. Um, it's yeah. not a song that is talking about, you know, something that you can necessarily relate to or whatever, but it's, it, it is, that's a beautiful song. Yeah, and I just amen her, as well. Her vocals are just outstanding in that. Yeah, yeah, amen as well is another one, another yeah. standout. Yeah, and and 
her career track though is is the curious part the next part of the jewel story <laughs> mm -hmm. is she kind of goes with you know this album pieces of you uh comes out with spirit which eric said was his favorite mm -hmm. um which is kind of you know had that song hands right um which it's it's kind of like the next evolution yeah it's for her it's still in the same kind of wheelhouse right right and then she does like a holiday album and then she does an album called this way and then her fourth was it just her fourth album uh <laughs> is 0304 the dance album which which yeah which is a kind of you know this is what 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 we call <laughs> this is like the hot space mits, misstep right no. I mean, this is kind of what Queen did is, is tried something different and it kind of didn't work. And she tried to kind of really just revamp her image. I liked it. I enjoyed Intuition. I l really liked that song because it's just a really great pop song. How did you feel about that? Because that's a total, that's a 180. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed the song okay. I obviously supported her. Like I was like, okay, you know, I went out and got it as soon, you know, as soon as it was available, I got it. But it wasn't one that I listened to over and over and over <laughs> because I just didn't feel that connection. I could tell there was a difference there. And then when I read her book, Never Broken, I realized that that album was a forced production because of her mom bankrupting her. Uh -huh. She had to do that album. And I could tell, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I was just like, something's not connected here, like with her other you know, I, I, and that's <laughs> you got, when you when you said that in the beginning, it sounded you kind of sounded like the friend who doesn't like the boyfriend. Like I'm gonna so I'm gonna support I'm gonna support you on that. I, I support you yeah. on this, but you know I'm not really you know like I, I'm here for you. Like the, the way you said it about well, I'm, yeah. I'm, I support her and what she's doing, but not really my thing. You know, so that kind of <laughs> which kind of makes sense. You know, it, it, that's interesting. I, I didn't realize. I mean, obviously she was going for a more pop oriented sound. And it must have thrown her her fan base for a loop. For me, it was just kind of like, okay, yeah, this is just a different thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what's funny is when I saw A Star Is Born with um, Lady Gaga um, and Bradley Cooper, it, that whole scene where they're uh, you know transforming her into the the pop star and they color her hair and all that kind of stuff that that made me think, oh, this is probably what <laughs> Jewel had to go through when she, yeah. you know when they were doing Intuition because it was so kind of opposite of her absolutely so, yeah i i flat out did not like it at all it's just to me it just you know i like the video it was nice to, she's oh does, of course she's, no, she's easy she's very easy on the no, eyes so yeah the video was nice but uh i i just did i just to me it just felt like yeah this is there's something off so, here so, and so she would but she would defend it i think she at the time she was like i just wanted to make a dance album yeah because that's there's why, nothing I, wrong you know with that. right now, kelly so, how many times did you see how many times have you seen jewel um, I think four now. Four. Has yeah. she ever done intuition? She's done the song. Yeah. I, I mean, and I does she, does she it. do it like, like in a different arrangement? Like, kind oh of, yeah, absolutely. You know, like acoustic. I mean, well, let me back up and say, she always does her songs different. Like okay. yeah. almost every, every single show is different. So, um, it's arranged slightly different, but I, I don't remember her. I mean, just the one song. I don't. I, I can't even tell you what other songs were on that. Oh no, it's, it's but, just it's just intuition. Yeah. I mean, that's the song. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they use that for like a I women know. a woman's like razor like yeah, a shaver? That, what, that song was written again. That was the whole commercial side of it. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I mean, her to write it was that song. it was that was a package deal. I, yeah, I, I, I recall razor. it was yeah. like it was specifically written for that commercial. It was yeah, and and you know the song became a hit or whatever. But yeah, yeah mission, it was I mean like, mission accomplished. Then I mean if that if that was the intent, I mean she yeah. probably wasn't too happy about it. But right, you know it's, I think she was trying to build up a relationship with her mom. Is, is that is that yeah. right, babe? I mean it's just yeah, she, she was, was. Uh, and her mom just took her. Uh, just wait for granted and just became like she lived vicariously through her and, and mm -hmm. got rich because of her. And, that, and, and so they, you know, they kind of, I guess they severed ties after a time, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's just, you know, again, it was one of those sad stories and music yeah. that chick, you know, chick razor. <laughs> yeah. <what> was for. <laughs> so yeah, she got a little backlash for that because the yep. song kind of deals with, selling out. If you look at the music video, it's kind of like, it was, it was almost like, a, you know, not not the best look for her because the, the the music video and the lyrics deal with that kind of stuff is is 
kind of well, selling she, out. Well, that, and, that, and that, that goes back to my point about her corporate, being... And then, it, then she it makes the deal with Chick and sells that song. Yeah. She, <laughs> she, she, like I said, she was very... She looks at life in a very sarcastic way. Uh-huh. She did that, you know, it's like on purpose. But yet, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's kind you know, of... The point is that, okay, you have to write this song. Okay, I will. But I'm basically going to call this out for what it is. Yeah. 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 But that, yeah. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah, I mean it was a, it was a pretty big dance hit, but but yeah, it must have been a head scratcher for the for the Jewel fans that are used to something. Again, that's like James Taylor doing a heavy metal album, <laughs> right? I'm, right? It's like kind of you're not like you you would you know there there's progressions that artists take right over time. They start off as one thing and then they end up somewhere else. But that was kind of from one album, boom all yeah. of a sudden and then her next album or or, or after that pivots to country mm-hmm. which i loved that right? that one i loved and the whole progression of that because again i felt like she was uh still speaking from her soul still you know giving that but i think her um influences uh, there was a lot of country there to begin with so i think you know she mm-hmm took that um but, but like yeah i like that it was back to the more of the roots but a different version of it so yeah prob- probably probably a a, a a nat that's probably a more natural progression mm-hmm. because by the the mid 2000s or early 2000s that whole ship quote unquote had sailed right alanis morissette had kind of come and gone and waned and 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 lilith fair only ran for three years and and it seemed like the like that dawning of the the female or the resurgence of the female singer songwriter had kind of receded yeah what kind you of know and, and that kind of music yep. just you know like it, it you know in the 2000s things just kind of really went different um more poppy more dancey more rap a, a lot right. of a lot more diverse stuff ha- hitting the charts um so country would be that i think the next natural evolution for her because yeah she is close if you're going to put her somewhere or you're going to say where does she fit closer after singer songwriter it would be it would, i think it would be country yeah i think a lot of it had to do with her husband at the time she married you know ty murray who was a rodeo star and you know and all that kind of, i think you know i think they moved to texas they had a ranch and so a lot of that that kind of lifestyle like creeped into her her music as well and unfortunately like i'm, I'm not surprised but they didn't last they i guess they lasted for a good long time and then they ended up splitting up so that's 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 jewel though you know because she's such a free spirit that i think uh you know she doesn't stick around for any anything too long like she just kind of goes from one thing one life experience to another i think and now here here she is raising a son on her own um and uh so that's a whole nother chapter in her life that is new to her and and just you know just a, a whole whole different thing but that's great. I mean, I, that's that's just her. I, I love that free free spirit about her. I love that confidence. I love how she's got a very interesting story. Yeah, I actually and, and, I actually read the book myself. You know, so I thought it was you know I thought it was great. You know, so and and then there's the, the whole other side which I had gotten wrong on a previous episode where I thought that Jack White was in the movie Ride with the Devil, <laughs> right? And you corrected me. It was Cold Mountain, but Jewel yeah. Jewel was in Ride with the Devil. That's right. Yeah. And that that was kind of her feature film kind of debut. Debut. Yeah. You know, and uh and she was very good in it too. Yeah, Toby yeah. Maguire, Skeet, Skeet Ulrich, uh Jeffrey Wright, Jeffrey Wright. just yep. uh, Jim Caviezel, mm-hmm. uh Tom Wilkinson. So that you know, a lot of heavy hitters at that time for actors. Um she was right there in the thick of it and and really just really a, a pretty good actress. A great, honestly. it's a, a, a un, very underrated film, in my opinion. Uh, a, a nice, a great civil war story, you know, epic type of story, but it's, yeah, I don't think it got enough, quite enough credit that I, I, I think it deserved, you know, I thought it was very good. Uh, Ang Lee directed it. Yeah. So yeah, that she, you know, he gave her her shot and she, you know, she, you know, obviously, I think I I think I bought the movie because she was in it at that point, well, you, you know, <laughs> but uh, uh, but no, it just, you know, it's one of those things, you know, but then she I think I also I think she just did something where she played June Carter Cash. She was in like a made for TV uh, biopic about her and ring of was, ring of fire. Yeah. You know, so was that That's was cool. that like a Hallmark production or something? Probably I think it was like because one she's of those also yeah. done some Hallmark films. She's yeah, she's, she's done a series called uh a fixer, a fixer upper mysteries, 
where she oh, plays like right. <laughs> she plays like a like a TV home renovator, and then she gets involved in like a Nancy Drew style mystery thing. And she did yeah. two of those for the Hallmark Channel. So you're not you're not too far off. And if she's been in if she's been in a holiday movie, it was probably a Hallmark, of course, or, or Lifetime. I'm not you know I, I don't know that she's been in any, but it's yeah that's what uh, that's what she's doing. So she yeah, and, and she's also a writer as well, mm-hmm. right? Yes, so she's she- not only written uh, books of poetry. But she's also written written her memoir, right? Yeah, which is so which is, again very good. Yeah, I, it's I would really highly good. recommend I, it. Yeah, yeah, me too. So, um, I mean, some of the live shows that you know, I think you probably saw her one more time, and we went like three times together. And I think there was one show that I didn't see with you. I like the you know I like telling the story of like the you know, the the one woman show as I call it, where I don't particularly care for a lot of artists when they do a lot of bantering and, and, and talking to the audience and kind of, you know, love me, you know, whatever kind of reaching out, that kind of thing. <laughs> I, I, in this case though, it was, it was her basically tell it, it, it could have been like something that she could have done like on like off Broadway or something like that. Like, like a story, like from, a storytellers type thing. You're going from like theater to theater yeah. and doing this as a, as like a, a running thing, even in like New York city or something, I could see her doing, I thought it was great. And of course there was that couple in front of us that uh, this woman was completely drunk and and she was just loud and belligerent. She's like, sing the song. And you know, like she just, because Jules just, and Jules, she was a trooper. She just, she just totally ignored her. Went on with the show, you know, she's, you know, whatever. And it was just very reminiscent of those coffee house days because it was just her and her guitar. There was no band. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so it was nice to go back to that, you know? Yeah. And just I think, stripped down, proving that she can, yeah. she can do it. You know, That's she right. doesn't need all that stuff, you know? And uh, Eric, you said that you don't like a lot of banter. From the I don't, artists. well, there's a different, there's a difference. If, if somebody okay. has a story to tell, that's one thing, but you know, when okay. somebody's kind of joking around, okay. trying to like playing, like we, went and saw save it that's what i was getting towards so when, when we do when we do our bob dylan episode we will tell you the <laughs> we will tell you the story we will tell you the actually, story about was, bob dylan that was not the, the oh. story i was going to tell oh, which one bahamas no it was uh actually foo fighters and kelly can okay. attest to this oh. right it was dave Grohl <laughs> and our good friend andy Camines, <laughs> who's a huge fan of, of dave Grohl. i mean even he will admit that this show was like i guess it was like their anniversary show or something like that it was like him them coming back in a big way and this was just a few years ago when we went to see him in in florida and and the whole show was him doing nothing but like in the middle of the song he would stop and and just like like play the guitar and like the call and response from the audience Mm -hmm. literally like every song for like three hours and that was that was just a little much for me so it's just like you know one of those kinds of things where (laughs) yeah you know but in this case it's 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 her telling her story and that was the show you know, yeah, and that makes it more stuff. engaging. Also, when they're yeah. when they're sharing, yeah. uh, we had just said that on on one of our our previous shows too. Yeah. Is is when I, I like that when when artists are kind of off the cuff or accessible like mm-hmm. that, where they're telling you about something, uh, and it makes you pay attention to it, right? If they're telling you about something that happened when they wrote the song, or I was at this point in my life, that's right. You're going to sit yeah. there and, and you're going to listen a little bit more to hear what it was and what the story was. So even if you're not into that artist per se, they're drawing you in by, Mm -hmm. by giving you a reason and saying, yeah, this is what was going on. Or I wrote this about my brother when we were young and he hit me over the head with a rock or whatever. And and you're going to listen to that song and see what it is and see how it fits, you know? And and that's, that's one of the great things. So the kudos to Jewel for, for just being able to continue to do that is just go out there with the guitar and not, not you know stay true to herself and not have things become a crutch where yeah i need, i only go out with a band now i only go out and do that it's like no she could just grab the guitar yeah. and you want me to play sure i'll play which and again she, you don't you don't see a lot of she still has the voice i mean nothing's really changed and in fact she still has that she could still do that like little girl type voice in, in a lot of her so- songs even now even today a nice another nice companion piece to pieces of you was was picking up the pieces I think it came out on the 20th anniversary mm-hmm. of Pieces of You, which was a very good album. And of course, another song on that will, I don't think Kelly and I could listen to without both of us weeping, which is. God, uh, I, what, what is your Kleenex bill in your house? Because you're crying, you cry at every song. No, no, it's rare for me to cry. <laughs> so. He, it is. He, it he drop, is. He, I'm I'm far more sentimental. He, than, Eric, than Eric drops the needle on a record and he cries for the needle because he dropped it. 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Oh yep. no! I I I I dropped the needle on the record. And this so. <laughs> this was actually a song that I I, I should have picked for uh, uh, our duets episode. Which All right, let's we, get an honorable which, mention in. Which was the uh, my father's daughter in the song she does with Dolly Parton. So Would that, you I, sing I, that? Who's it? Who's it sung with? Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So um, and they're both telling stories about their where they came from, their mm-hmm. lineage, and it's it's beautiful and cool. And I knew when I first heard it, because I had I listened to the album before I picked it up for Kelly, but I listened to it in the car. I was crying listening to this song, and I knew for sure that she would start crying when I so when I played it, she, you know, I, I, I'm like looking up, I'm driving and I'm looking over at the side, you know, and I could see the tears like, you know, streaming down her face. Yeah, but, but no, but you have to understand, Dean, this is it because I cried everything. This is because I don't cry at anything. Like these are gotcha. very specific yeah. things that he's always trying to give me. Like when we watch the movie and I'll just look over like. Yeah, he's trying to, he's crying. He's crying and you're not. So we're going to, we're going to, as we tie this up, we're going to leave you with, with one of the last words, Kelly, is why would, why would somebody want to visit this album now okay thank you because that's what i've been dying to say oh Hold see on. i didn't even know that no. <laughs> you should have ju- just said shut the hell up eric I'm no, no, to no, I, like no, it always no, does it <laughs> wouldn't, it wouldn't be anything different now is the perfect time to revisit this album because it is so relevant today if you listen to these songs a lot and again yeah like pieces of you are is very uncomfortable to listen to adrian has this (laughs) even though you know it it is also a difficult and it's funny because i i was trying to think when you said guess what song and then i was thinking because i would skip that one a lot because you you listen to it and you're like this is so tragic like you know but it has its own Point. And someone sure. who relates to that song will love it. You know what I mean? Like if, if you've ever had, suffered some kind of a trauma like that or, so, you know, and um, Little Sister is so reminiscent of like the opioid crisis that we're going through right now. And like what people are, are dealing with, with, you know, dealing with loved ones that have um, are suffering through that. So I think every single song you could relate to something that's going on today. So okay. it definitely is something that it, to me is timeless. It's definitely not something that's said in a particular, but it also has that um, me remembering my youth, you know, like when I was that age and how instrumental it was when I was that age. And then as I grew up and we had kids and we would travel now, this album is embedded in our children's lives as far as like they that's know right. yeah. they know jewel through me and i mm-hmm. think that's such a great you know it's such a great thing and then when they listen to it it's like they're connecting back to me as much you know so sure okay yeah. uh, a couple of questions as we close out is this a top 10 album for you of top 10 oh, of all time yeah for sure is it top five yeah i would say it's top three top, five? <laughs> top three okay top three um, one final question. Do you follow 3324 podcast on social media? Good. Cause, cause I'm going to take this opportunity as we close out to ask everybody to follow us on 3324 podcast on Instagram and Facebook. You can find us there. We are very vibrant in social media and you'll find Kelly Cooper in the comments as well. So if you want to see what she's writing and, and see what she, what opinion she's giving, she's there as well. So we're going to, we're going to tie it up. So this was, uh, I think what I'm getting from Kelly is relevant then and relevant now as far as this album goes and uh, definitely give it, give it a whirl. I think with the, you know, with the resurgence kind of recently of Joni Mitchell, all of a sudden, for some reason, she's always in the news and she's going here and going there. Yeah. Um, this will be a nice time to revisit the singer songwriter aesthetic of the nineties when we saw that resurgence. And and thank you, Kelly, uh, for joining us and, and giving us your insight into this album. It really kind of helped fill out the backstory and, and to hear you telling stories of what it meant to you. Uh, was really special as well. So that's going to do it for us. Again, social media, 3324 podcast, Instagram, Facebook. We have live shows there. We interact with uh, with everybody. Uh, if you've got an idea, something you want us to cover, hit us up in the comments uh, and we will get back to you about it. So for that, this has been Dean. And for Eric, we will catch you on the flip side. 
You've been listening to the 3324 Podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important, so make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 